Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of Laplace transforms and focus on how we can actually use them to solve both first order and higher order ordinary differential equations. As a very basic starting example, we're just going to be looking at a very uh, nice example of a first order linear inhomogeneous differential equation, y prime plus 5y is equal to the sine of x with the initial condition that y of 0 is equal to 3. You should be able to already know how to solve this using integrating factors and separability with integration. But let's assume you don't. And let's see if we can use Laplace transforms to solve this for us. Um, because there might be some other equations that you don't know how to solve. For example, some higher order differential equations. Um, the inhomogeneous case in particular. Um, and Laplace transforms can actually allow you to solve them um, without having to know any additional uh, differential equation tricks. So in case you don't already know, but you definitely should, uh, the Laplace transform of some function of a spatial variable x is defined to be equal to the integral transform from zero to infinity of the function f of x times this function e to the minus wx dx, with some people, which some people sometimes refer to as a kernel function, an exponential kernel. So what we really need to know in terms of the Laplace transform is how to find the Laplace transforms of derivatives of unknown functions. So the main theorem that's going to guide us through solving differential equations is us being able to know how to define the Laplace transform of y prime of x, even though we don't know exactly know what y is. So if we just use the definition, this is just going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of y prime of x times e to the minus omega x dx. And you're like, okay, well, how can I integrate this? Well, I know that y prime of x is a function. And I know how to anti-differentiate it. So a reasonable approach for this would be integration by parts. So we can let, for example, dv be equal to y prime of x dx, because we know that v is just going to be equal to y of x, which means that our u needs to be chosen to be equal to e to the minus omega x, which means that du will be equal to minus omega e to the minus omega x dx. Right? So that's going to be our integration by parts setup. So once we have that, what will we have? So that's going to be equal to uv, so e to the minus omega x times y of x, which is just going to be evaluated as x goes to infinity and as x goes to zero, minus the integral of v du, so it's going to be plus omega times v du. Okay? So what do we got? So as x goes to infinity, this omega this exponential term is going to go to zero. As x goes to zero, this exponential term is going to go to one, and y is going to go to y evaluated at zero. So we're going to have the Laplace transform of y is going to be equal to zero minus y of zero. And then over here we have omega times, and this is just the definition of the Laplace transform of y, right? So the Laplace transform of y prime is equal to this. So how we're going to write it from here on, this is the Laplace transform of y prime is just equal to omega times the Laplace transform of y minus our initial condition evaluated at x is equal to zero. So this is going to be our guiding star when we're solving our differential equations. Okay? So let's bring back our nice little example that we want to explore. In particular, y prime plus 5y is equal to the sine of x with y is zero being equal to 3. So taking the Laplace transform of both sides of this equation, we're going to have the Laplace transform of y prime plus the Laplace transform of 5y is equal to the Laplace transform of the sine of x. So as just previously proven, uh, the Laplace transform of y prime is going to be equal to omega times the Laplace transform of y minus y of 0, which is equal to 3. And then over here we have 5 times the Laplace transform of y and we know that the Laplace transform of sine of x is just going to be 1 divided by omega squared plus 1. So what we have on the left-hand side is two Laplace transform of y terms. So I'm just going to factor that out. So I'm going to have omega plus 5 times the Laplace transform of y. And that's going to be equal to 3 plus 1 over omega squared plus 1. So I'm just going to rewrite this with a common denominator with omega squared plus 1 on the left-hand side, and that's going to give me 3 omega squared plus 4, all divided by omega squared plus 1. 
So once we have that, I'm just then going to divide both sides by this omega plus five term. And that's gonna give me my Laplace transform of y term by itself. Keep in mind, y is our solution that we're aiming for, and we're looking at the Laplace transform of it. In particular, three omega squared plus four, all over omega plus five times omega squared plus one. Obviously, we have a quadratic on top and a cubic on bottom, so we can directly use partial fraction decomposition on this. So we're going to be looking for constants a over omega plus 5 and constants b omega plus c all over this omega squared plus 1 term. Right. So with partial fraction decomposition, so partial fraction decomposition, this is going to give us our constants a is equal to 79 over 26, b is equal to minus 1 over 26, and c is equal to 5 over 26, and that's going to give us the Laplace transform in closed form. So our Laplace transform of y will be equal to, so we're going to have 79 over 26 times 1 over omega plus 5, and then we're going to have over here, let's write it as negative 1 over 26 times omega over omega squared plus 1, and then plus 5 over 26 1 over omega squared plus 1. To make this more obvious, this is omega squared plus 1 squared, and that's omega squared plus 1 squared on the bottom as well, which are just cosines and sines in disguise. So if you can recognize what that, that, and that are Laplace transforms of, then you have your solution. That means the particular solution for this differential equation is going to be 79 over 26 times e to the minus 5x, and over here we have minus 1 over 26 times the cosine of x plus 5 over 26 times the sine of 1x, right? And that is the solution of our differential equation. And if you're curious as to what the general solution is going to be, um, one can find using your method of integrating factors that that is your arbitrary constant c. This constant here and that constant there are going to be true for all solutions of this particular differential equation. Okay. Now, I just want to make a couple things clear because we're trying to, you know, bridge a nice little foundation for our theory of higher order differential equations. So a couple notes I want to mention here. If we look at just the equation y prime plus 5y is equal to zero, the homogeneous portion of our original differential equation, one can find that the homogeneous solution, which I'm just going to abbreviate as y subscript h, is going to be equal to c e to the minus 5x, which is this term right there on the left hand part of my general solution or my particular solution for my inhomogeneous equation, right? So that is our homogeneous solution. And if we have y prime plus 5y is equal to sine of x, our inhomogeneous solution, uh, one can verify that the solution yp equals negative 1 over 26 cosine of x plus 5 over 26 sine of x is a particular solution. So we have two characters here. We have our homogeneous solution, homogeneous solution to our differential equation, and then we have a particular solution. So our particular solution to our inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous, equation. And if we look at our general solution, which is given above, and I'll reprove them via Laplace transforms, we see that the general solution is just equal to our homogeneous solution plus a particular solution of our inhomogeneous equation. And one can show that for all nth order constant coefficient ordinary differential equations, both homogeneous and inhomogeneous, this type of structure is always what you're going to be going for, right? Which is actually pretty interesting. So obviously we can use Laplace transforms to solve first order linear equations, but that doesn't really give us anything new. 
because we already know how to solve a lot of first order differential equations, whether they be um, Bernoulli, which includes some nonlinear terms, uh, exact and non exact differential equations, first order linear inhomogeneous equations, even a Riccati equation, for example. So Laplace transforms is not really giving us anything new for first order. But if we don't know how to solve higher order, the question naturally that we should ask is well, can Laplace transform help us solve things that we don't already know how to solve? And the answer, of course, is yes. So, in order to solve first order differential equations, we had to know what the Laplace transform of y prime was. So, in order to solve second order differential equations, we need to know how to solve uh, the Laplace transform of y double prime into things we should already know. So, if we just use the definition of the Laplace transform on y double prime, that's just going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of y double prime of x times e to the minus omega x in dx. So we're going to be approaching this just like before. We're going to be letting u be equal to e to the minus omega x. Therefore, du will be equal to minus omega e to the minus omega x dx, with dv being equal to y double prime of x dx, with a trivial antiderivative of y prime of x. Right. So using integration by parts, again, we're going to have that this is going to be equal to uv, so e to the minus omega x times y double prime of x, and this of course needs to be evaluated as x goes to infinity and as x goes to zero, minus the integral from zero to infinity of v du, right? So v is going to change that minus to a plus with an omega hanging outside, and then we're going to have y prime of x times e to the minus omega x dx. It's very important to observe that this right-hand side, this integral, that's just the Laplace transform of y prime, which we already know. On here on the left-hand side, as x goes to infinity, that's going to go to zero. And as x goes to zero, that exponential is going to go to one, and then we're going to have y double prime of zero there. So therefore, the Laplace transform of y double prime, and that should be y single prime, right? So that's uv and v is y single prime. So the Laplace transform of y double prime will be equal to uv, which is just going to be equal to 0 minus y prime of 0 plus omega times the Laplace transform of y prime. Right? Um, now, what was the Laplace transform of y prime? Well, we already know what that was. That's going to be equal to, so let's bring that omega here, and then we're going to have omega times the Laplace transform of y minus y of 0, and let's not forget our minus y prime of 0. Let's distribute this omega m. That's going to give us an omega squared term, and therefore we're going to have the Laplace transform of the second derivative of y will be equal to omega squared times Laplace transform of y minus omega times the initial condition y0 minus y prime of zero, which is going to be our second initial condition. So you're like, okay, that's cool. Can we do this for the third? The answer is yes. So obviously we're building a mathematical induction statement here. So this is going to be equal to omega three times Laplace transform of y minus omega squared times y of zero minus omega y prime of zero minus y double prime of zero. So like, okay, I see a pattern, but notice that the only thing we need is Laplace transform of y. y zero, y prime zero, y double prime zero, they're just numbers, and therefore this is just a polynomial, right? So let's just isolate these two sets of terms and see if we can combine that into a summation notation. So just focus on focusing on the third derivative. What we have here again is the w cubed Laplace transform of y, common negative term out of all those, that's obvious. And this is just the sum from k is equal to zero to two of omega to the power, let's start off with this term. Right? So that's omega to the zero, then we have omega to the one, and then omega to the power of two. And then notice that we're starting off with the second derivative, then the first, then the zeroth derivative last, right? So that's gonna be equal to y to the power of, let's say, two minus k derivative evaluated at zero. Because it's two minus zero, which is two, two minus one, which is one, and then two minus two, which is zero, right? So they're sort of going in backwards directions. So that would be the compact representation for the Laplace transform of y cubed, which is which gives us the analytical tools to generalize this. So therefore, here's your superstar statement. So the Laplace transform 
of the nth derivative of x will be equal to omega to the power of m times the Laplace transform of our unknown function y, which is what we're aiming for, minus the sum from k is equal to 0 to n minus 1 of omega to the power of k, and then y to the order n minus k minus 1's derivative evaluated at 0. And that is the general expression for the Laplace transform of the nth derivative of y. Right? So notice that this is what we are looking for. What we are looking for. So once we have the Laplace transform of y is equal to some function of omega, right? Because that's going to give us the Laplace transform of y is equal to some function of omega, who knows what it is. And then we're going to be like, okay, y is just going to be equal to the inverse Laplace transform of f omega. And that's going to be our solution to our nth order um, initial value problem, which is actually pretty nice. Now that we have the theory built, let's do a couple examples. Okay, so let's look at this second order constant coefficient, linear, homogeneous, ordinary differential equation, y double prime minus 4y prime plus 4y equals 0, with initial conditions y0 equals 0, y prime 0 equals 3. So the first thing we need to do is take the Laplace transform of y double prime minus 4y prime minus 4y and 0. Once we do that using the theory previously derived, we're going to have omega squared times the Laplace transform of y minus omega times y of 0, which in this case is going to be 0, minus y prime of 0, which in this case is going to be 3. So that's going to be the Laplace transform of y double prime. And then over here, we're going to have minus 4 times the Laplace transform of y prime, which is just going to be omega times the Laplace transform of y minus y of 0, which in this case is 0, and plus 4 times the Laplace transform of y. And that's all going to be equal to the Laplace transform of 0, which we know is going to be 0. So the first thing we want to do is move our Laplace transform of y terms together and factor. And then we're going to have omega squared minus 4 omega plus 4 times the Laplace transform of y. And then we have this term that's equal to 0. That term isn't contributing anything. And we have this minus 3 hanging out here. So let's just shift that to the right-hand side. Now, before we move on with the solution, I just want to make one very important observation. This and the original differential equation are very closely connected. So if we replace the y, the kth derivative of y in our ordinary differential equation with our omega to the power of k term, we get this little polynomial in terms of omega times the Laplace transform of y. Some people will actually give this equation a name. Some people call it a characteristic equation because there is some connection between our differential equation in this algebraic equation. Obviously, they have the same exact powers in terms of order and degree, and one is a differential equation, one is just a polynomial equation. So there is actually a deeper connection between these two things, which we'll dive into later, but at least just observe that that's actually what we have going on here. So dividing both sides by the polynomial and observing that that is just omega minus two to the power of two, we're gonna have that Laplace transform of y, is equal to 3 divided by omega minus 2 to quantity squared, which, in case you don't realize it, that's just 3 divided by u to the power of 2, um, which is just a shifted version of the Laplace transform of x, right? And keep in mind, when you multiply an exponential in the spatial, in the spatial domain by a function, it's just going to perform that particular shift. So, using our Laplace transform operations from the past, we know that y is just going to be equal to a shifted version, in particular to the right 2. So that's going to be equal to positive 2x multiplied by 3x, right? And you probably would write that as y is equal to 3x times e to the 2x, and that is your particular solution to your original differential equation. The next example that I want to look at um, for illustrating how to use Laplace transforms for higher order differential equations is just a slight variation um, from this first example. The only difference is I'm changing my initial condition at y of 0, 
right? The first one we did y is equal to zero, and now we're gonna do y of zero is equal to minus two. Same exact homogeneous constant coefficient ordinary differential equation, um, and everything else the same except for that. So my question to you is this. Is the solution for this differential equation just gonna be a scalar multiple of that? For example, would it be like 5x, e to the 2x, 7x equal to 2x, some number x equal to that? equal to the e to the 2x, or will it be something completely different, or sort of different, subtly different, moderately different, up to you how you define those terms. So it doesn't matter. Let's just use Laplace transforms and see what will happen with this. So the start of this is still going to be the same. We're still going to have omega squared minus 4 omega plus 4 times the Laplace transform of y. The only difference is on the right hand side, instead of just having three like we had before, we're gonna be having 11 minus two omega. And I'll let you fill in the details on how to get that particular term by using those little expressions that we derived for the second, first, and ordinary Laplace transform. So once we have that, once we divide both sides by the, um, that little polynomial, our characteristic equation, we're gonna have the Laplace transform of y is equal to 11 minus two omega all over omega minus two, the quantity squared, which keep in mind, we can break up because that's the quadratic term. So that's just gonna be equal to say, omega over a, minus, a over omega minus two, the quantity squared, um, plus b over omega minus two, right? So using partial fraction decomposition, one can show that a will be equal to seven and b will be equal to minus two which means that our Laplace transform of y is just gonna be equal to seven all over omega minus two to the quantity squared minus two over omega minus two. So for our first example, this was the only function that we had in our frequency domain. Just to change in our initial condition, now we have another little function sort of appended on to our solution, which is actually pretty interesting. So once we do the Laplace, inverse Laplace transform, we're gonna have y is equal to seven x e to the two x. And over here, we just have a lonely little exponential minus two e to the two x. And obviously you can factor out that e to the two x and write this as seven x minus two if it makes you any happier. So a slight change in initial condition actually can change your con uh, condition a lot more than just a constant. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind because some people will be like, oh, if I change the initial condition, which is just a number, um, then my particular solution might just change by a scalar value. But that's not necessarily the case because in this case we see that the behavior of the function, instead of being a constant exponential product, now we have a linear exponential product, which can be very, very different in terms of its long-term behavior. The last example that I want to introduce you all in terms of how Laplace transforms can be used to solve equations, not just differential equations, but they can also be used to solve what is called integral equations. So let's lay down a couple theoretical things that we're going to need for this exploration. Let's suppose that y of x can be expressed as an accumulation function. In particular, one of the form, the integral from zero to x of some function f of t dt. So a couple things that you definitely should know. For example, if we evaluate this integral at y is equal to zero, uh, x is equal to zero, I mean, that's going to be equal to the integral from zero to zero of f of t dt. Regardless of whatever function f of t is, as long as it's integrable, um, we shouldn't have any issues and that should be equal to zero. And if I take the derivative of y with respect to x, which is just the derivative with respect to x from zero to x of f of t dt, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, that's just gonna be equal to the function f of x. So with these two things, we will be able to derive another expression. So if we recall, something we derived moments earlier about the Laplace transform of y prime, this was just equal to omega times Laplace transform of y minus y of zero. But if y is expressed as an integral function, then y of zero will be equal to zero, and this part is just going to cancel it out, and we should be able to solve this equation for the Laplace transform of y. So the Laplace transform of y is just gonna be equal to one over omega times the Laplace transform of y prime. So what is y? Well, y was defined to be a integral function. So we have the Laplace transform of the integral from zero to x of some function of t dt, 
will just be equal to 1 over omega times the Laplace transform of that function. So not only can we take the Laplace transform of derivatives of unknown functions, we can also take the Laplace transform of iterations of integration of those unknown functions as well. So with this new theoretical piece of insight, let's look at any new differential equation, in particular y prime plus 4y plus 5 times the integral from 0 to x of y dx, and let's assume that this is all equal to e to the minus x, with the initial condition that y of 0 is equal to 0. So it's not really a differential equation because we don't just have derivatives, but we have integrals as well. So this is sometimes referred to as a differ integro, a differ integro equation, or a DIE for short. So a differ integral or a differ integral, some people say, equation. So, Laplace transforms can be used to solve different integral equations. That's pretty cool. So let's apply the Laplace transform to y prime for y, 5 integral of y, and then e to the x at the end. So using our rules as previously defined, we're going to have omega times the Laplace transform of y minus y of 0, plus 4 times the Laplace transform of y, and then plus 5 times the Laplace transform of that integral, which is going to be 1 over omega times the Laplace transform of y, and then we're going to have the Laplace transform of e to the minus x. So y of 0 was defined to be equal to 0, so that's exciting and goes away. And now we can group together our Laplace transform of y terms into one expression. Once we do that, we're going to have omega plus 4 plus 5 over omega times the Laplace transform of y, and that's going to be equal to the Laplace transform of e to the minus x, which we know is going to be 1 over omega plus 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get the left-hand side as a rational function in omega because we need to divide both sides by it. And if it's as a rational function, this will be super easy. So we're going to have omega squared plus 4 omega plus 5 all over omega times the Laplace transform of y is equal to 1 over omega plus 1. Once we have this, then we can divide both sides by this, and then we're going to have the Laplace transform of y will be equal to omega over omega plus 1 times omega squared plus 4 omega plus 5. Okay, so that gives us this expression. So obviously we're going to be performing some partial fraction decomposition here. So we are going to be looking for constants that will give this to be a over omega plus 1, and then plus b omega plus c all over omega squared plus 4 omega plus 5, right? So once we do this partial fraction decomposition, you should be able to find that a, b, c will be equal to minus 1 half, 1 half, and 5 halves as our constants. And also note that you should be able to complete the square on this omega squared plus 4 omega plus 5. So remember, if you don't know, remember how to complete the square, just take the number in, in front of 4 divided by 2 and square it. So 4 divided by 2 is 2, and 2 squared is 4. And then we're going to add it and subtract it. And don't forget your lonely little 5 that was there. And these first four terms will always be able to be factored. And you're just going to be left with omega 2 squared plus 1. So combining these algebraic results, we can get an alternative representation for the Laplace transform of y. So that's going to give us negative one half divided by omega plus one, and then we're going to have plus one half times omega all over omega plus two squared plus one squared, and then we're going to have plus five over two times one all over omega plus two squared plus one squared, which we should recognize as sine and cosine. So once we have that, we can then invert the Laplace transform here, and we're going to have that y will be equal to negative one half e to the minus x plus one half e to the minus two x cosine of x, one x actually, and then five halves e to the minus two x times the sine of one x as well. And that is our solution to our original differential equation. 
right? And that's, you know, very interesting because we can not just solve uh, differential equations, but we can also solve different integral and just integral equations as a whole. Now there's just one small thing I want to mention. Um, let's suppose that our initial condition is something like y of a is equal to b, where a is not necessarily equal to zero. All you have to do is perform a substitution, a substitution um, to shift our initial condition to another function, for example, u of zero um, will be equal to b as well. And just observe the relationship between y and u, and then you know work backwards once you're shifted. Overall, nothing too complicated, and algebra will solve all your problems there. Okay, so that's how you can use Laplace transforms to solve ordinary differential equations and also some integral equations as well. There's several more little tricks, formulas, and special cases that you can consider with Laplace transforms. For example, what if it's a nonlinear equation? That's a fun problem, but we'll wait until another day to consider it. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.